Hey guys, so today we're going to talk a little bit about the perioperative care of the trauma patient. Um, I'm sure you've gotten lots of trauma this afternoon. So, leading cause of death in the first 35 years of life, especially with uh, young men, 50% of them die immediately, 30% die in the first hour. There's a very high likelihood that they're being going to be acutely intoxicated with, uh, you know, either therapeutic or recreational drugs and also a high likelihood of them having hepatitis or HIV. A lot of times we're, we have uh, these patients are critically ill, we know nothing about them, uh, and uh, have no idea what their status is. Insufficient time to place lines. We don't often know what the procedure is that we're going to do when we start the procedure, uh, and yet we still have to, you know, anesthetize them, paralyze them, resus resuscitate them. ABCs are important in trauma, um, disability and exposure and environment also very important. We need to keep these patients warm. You want to rapidly assess the airway. Um, closed airway trauma is the, occult airway trauma is the worst. I mean, an increasing strider can happen very quickly. You can lose your airway very quickly. Um, always assume there's a cervical spine injury, and as I've said, Glasgow Coma Scale of less than eight, equal or less than eight, requires definitive airway control. So, question, induction of anesthesia, positive pressure ventilation, it's associated with a gradual alveolar collapse, it's harmless in normal lungs if the duration is under two hours, it reduces DLCO by reduction of lung volume alone, or it results in a rapid alveolar collapse and increased shunt. Right, and it's, um, sorry. So, in actual fact, um, the uh, answer is D. Um, there is rapid uh, collapse of the uh, alveoli. It happens very quickly. Um, the first answer, A, uh, was that it was associated with a gradual collapse. That's not the case. Things happen very quickly. It is actually harmful in normal lungs. Um, you can see lung injury in just a normal anesthetic after just an hour, and that goes on for a couple hours afterwards. And the decrease in function is not just a function of um, the collapse of the alveoli, but the DLCO decreases as well, so the, the function of the lung, it doesn't work as well. Um, so remember, adequate airway doesn't mean adequate oxygenation and ventilation, clearly. Um, you want to auscultate for and percuss for hemoneumothorax, ultrasound, linear ultrasound on the chest, looking for sliding uh, pleura and B waves, also very helpful. Uh, patients that are intubated have to have the tube uh, placement confirmed. I've had patients arrive in the emergency, uh, in the emergency department 30 minutes after intubation that have an esophageal intubation and have been breathing spontaneously through their glottis as the tube is in their esophagus and their belly is now filled with gas from the mechanical or hand ventilation that they've received. Um, and then patients with adjunctive airways, LMAs, LTs, king airways, comba tubes have to have definitive airways placed. I mean, you can assess blood volume, cardiac output just by level of consciousness, skin color, pulse. Um, uh, hemorrhage, external hemorrhage can be controlled on the primary survey, but clearly it's the occult hemorrhage that we're worried about. American College of Surgeons shows uh, these are their classifications of shock. Class four shock is greater than two liters loss. It's greater than 40% of the circulating blood volume. Heart rates can be greater than 140, and what you can see is that these patients need to be resuscitated not just with um, volume, but they need uh, oxygen carrying capacity as well, so blood. You know, GCS, again, any GCS equal or less than eight requires intubation. 
you want to really look this patient over completely. They need to be completely uncovered, but warmth is very important. It's dramatically easier to maintain warmth than it is to recover warmth. So heated fluids, heated environments. If you come out of the burn room, the operating room that the burn patients go to, and you're not drenched in sweat, you're doing the patient a disservice. Things to keep in mind is that maxillary fractures are often associated with basilar skull fractures and cervical spine injuries. Isolated mandibular fractures are not. So um, be very careful of placement. Any instrumentation of the uh, nasopharynx or the nasal cavity with uh, any uh, mid-face fractures or any evidence that there might be a basilar skull fracture. Um, pulmonary contusions, uh, chest contusions. Um, these injuries with resuscitation can advance very quickly. So um, you really want to give them a good survey. Uh, blunt trauma to the chest can also cause aortic dissection. 70% of those patients uh, will rupture within 24 hours if they're not diagnosed and treated. This is an example of what happens if you try to pass nasopharyngeal airway and someone with a basilar skull fracture ends up in the third ventricle. Adjuncts to the primary survey, um, really uh, the take home point here is urinary catheters uh, should be placed but not until after rectal exam, especially if there's pelvic injury. You want to make sure there's no rupture of the uh, urethra or bladder. <coughs> Mechanisms very important uh, to your exam. We want to know whether it's blunt versus penetrating trauma, injuries from heat or cold, injuries from hazardous material. Uh, materials and then uh, adjunctive uh, exam after that is dictated by, by the injury. Indications for airway control, anyone who's had uh, a cardiopulmonary arrest uh, probably needs a definitive airway. Uh, impaired oxygenation and ventilation. Impending airway obstruction, again, people are becoming progressively striderous with neck injuries. Um, oftentimes combativeness, we intubate patients so that we can do exams to evaluate them. Um, chest trauma with dyspnea, again, chest trauma can lead to pulmonary contusion. Pulmonary contusion can progress very quickly with volume resuscitation, so you need to intubate those patients. Um, and then burn injuries with any singed uh, uh, nasal hair or any soot in the oropharynx can indicate that this patient's got a burn injury to their airway and it, uh, it uh, can swell shut very quickly. All these patients are full stomach. They, uh, they have to be treated as full stomach. Unfortunately, a lot of them can't tolerate uh, rapid sequence induction. Uh, cervical spine injuries clearly put the patient at risk for cord injury uh, when we intubate them. So it's nice to clear the neck. The trouble with clearing the neck is they have to be free of mind-altering drugs, therapeutic and recreational, but they also have to be free of distracting pain. And that's what prevents us from uh, clearing most of the necks on these patients. Um, but in spite of, uh, you know, risk of cord injury, you have, to, you have to avoid hypoxia. Different options for airway control, we'll talk about them a little bit. Nasal intubation can be done with the neck in a neutral position. It's very stable. Um, but the patient's got to be cooperative. They can't be combative. Um, you can, and clearly if they have risk of basal or skull fractures, you can do it with a bronchoscope, but um, again, you run the risk of uh, getting off track. Um, and if you do a blind nasal technique, which is a technique that you really need to be familiar with, the patient has to be breathing for that. The other thing with nasal intubations is if they fail and you progress to some video-assisted device, they can stir up a lot of bleeding. Direct laryngoscopy is still the quickest and the safest way to intubate a patient. There are no su studies suggesting that one uh, technique is better than the other. Uh, if we're doing it, you have to protect the cervical spine by holding inline axial stabilization, not traction. You don't want to pull the head off of shoulders that it's not connected to. You just want to make sure it stays in line. Uh, you need to remove the anterior portion of the uh, cervical collar, apply cardiac head pressure, and uh, proceed with your rapid sequence intubation. 
Jet ventilation is an option. It's kind of misnamed. It uh, should be called jet oxygenation. It's uh, rapid oxygenation provided through a 12, 14, or 16 French uh, transtracheal cannula, just an angiocath. It takes special equipment. It's high pressure. You can cause barotrauma. Um, it does not protect the airway. And uh, exhalation is passive. So if there's airway obstruction, the patient's not able to exhale. And slash car, I clearly uh, prefer the tracheostomy. I mean, there are a lot of Seldinger techniques uh, or kits available, but nothing really beats uh, an 11 blade uh, pair of Kelly's and a 6.0 and a tracheal tube. Fiber optic uh, intubation can be done with the neck in the neutral position, glide scope, uh, or any number of the video assisted devices, the CMAC or the Panasonic. Transillumination can be done in a dark room with a light wand, but again, this is a fairly specialized technique. Retrograde tech, uh, intubation takes a very long time, so it's discouraged. And in a pinch, if you need to, you can go to a uh, uh, rescue alternate airway device, Convitube, LT, King Airway, or LMA. So question, patients sustain uh, significant abdominal trauma. Uh, there's a uh, bladder pressure of 35. What would the patient expect to have? Decreased renal perfusion, decreased peak airway pressures, increased venous return, decreased cardiac output, or decreased interpulmonary shunting. Guitar. Okay, clearly. Um, decreased renal perfusion, not just from uh, venous congestion, from uh, the increased pressure in the, in the uh, renal vein, but also the uh, uh, low cardiac output uh, from the decreased venous return activates the renin angiotensin system and actually causes renal artery contract, uh, 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 contraction and um, decreases renal artery flow. Um, clearly, you'll have, increased, you'll have increased airway pressures from just the diaphragms pushing up and compressing the, the lungs, uh, decreased venous return, as we said, uh, cardiac output's decreased, and uh, it uh, adds from the diaphragm pushing up into the lungs a compressive atelectasis, which increases interpulmonary shunting. So in terms of resuscitation, our first goal is to uh, perfuse the tissues. Uh, that's particularly important uh, and uh, why volume is uh, so important in these patients. If the, patient, if the patient has a pelvic stabilization device in place, we have to have adequate IV access prior to removing that. Uh, things can go south very quickly. Uh, short, large bore catheters. The longer the catheter, the smaller the bore, the increase the resistance. If you use a subclavian line, you want it on the side of the fracture or, in, or rib fractures or injury uh, chest tubes. And IELTS are a reasonable adjunct, although I have to say we've seen a number of failures in our institution recently. First priority is volume. Patients rarely die of anemia. Um, set points for fluid warmers should be at 42 degrees. Red cells get injured at 46 degrees or above. Clearly no, no platelets through the warming devices. Rapid infusers should be able to get uh, a, uh, a unit of blood in in just a couple minutes. Um, always remember that blood loss is probably underestimated. Fluid loss during surgical exposure as I said before, it can be up to 10 to 15 cc's per kilo per hour. That's for third space losses. All the swelling in the bowel wall comes from the intervascular space. Crystalloids have to be used, of course, three to one, and uh, anesthesia itself increases, dilates out the capacitance vessels and increases your need for volume. Colloids can cause allergic immune reactions and electrolyte imbalances. Um, but again, there's no studies to support one being superior over the other. 
oxygen carrying capacity, that's our second priority. Fully cross-matched blood is best, but takes some time. Type-specific blood will avoid 95% of the transfusion reactions. O negative is fine. Unfortunately, if you have massive uh, transfusion requirements, O negative after four to six units, you need to continue. Um, and the acceptable hemoglobin is really dependent not just on the patient and their disease state, but the uh, speed at which they're bleeding out. I mean, if you have someone with an aortoesophageal fistula and four suckers in their mouth, you know, losing a liter of blood every 10 minutes, you're not going to be transfusing to a hemoglobin or hematocrit. The most common uh, um, coagulopathy in this patient, these patients is a dilutional thrombocytopenia. Our goal is to keep platelets over 70,000 if possible. Factor deficiencies happen later and should be replaced guided by lab tests, um, not as a ratio. Uh, always anticipate needs and let the blood bank know that you're going to need a lot of blood. So induction of anesthesia for a stable patient, you can use regular old anesthesia. Unfortunately, these patients often look stable because they are on, on their reserves and they're at the end of their reserves. So um, you need to be very cautious and again have a very high level of suspicion. Um, most importantly, you need to go slowly and let the patient's response kind of dictate where you're going. Talk about IV agents, Atomidate, I said before, um, wrap it on very uh, uh, little myocardial depression, but again, there is an increased risk of adrenal suppression and mortality even with a single dose. Ketamine, very rapid. It's a great uh, hypnotic. You may want to add an angiolytic with it. It's a kind of a profound dysphoric. Um, it's very hemodynamically stable, but it's hemodynamically stable because it causes a release of endogenous catecholamines. Ketamine itself is a direct myocardial depressant. So if you have a patient that has uh, exhausted their endogenous catecholamines, theoretically the direct myocardial depression could um, overcome the uh, benefits, the release of catecholamines. It also is also going to uh, lead to some pretty profound uh, salivation. So again, if you're going to use any video, uh, video assisted uh, devices for airway management, you may want to use some glycopyrrolate if your patient can tolerate the tachycardia. Propofol, very rapid on, very rapid off, but it's a profound, again, it's a profound myocardial depression, depressant and vasodilator. But as in small increments can be good, can be very helpful. Uh, lidocaine will blunt the responses to intubation, the hemodynamic response to intubation at about a milligram per kilogram three minutes prior to intubation, but sometimes in these patients we want those responses, so we try not to. Fentanyl um, has very little hemodynamic or cerebrovascular effect. Uh, it's synergistic with our hypnotics. It can decrease our MAC or minimum alveolar concentration by 50%. The minimum alveolar concentration is the concentration, alveolar concentration of anesthetic that we need to keep 50% of patients from moving in response to surgical stimuli, um, essentially our ED50. Uh, fentanyl can decrease that. It uh, can cause bradycardia. It uh, is a uh, uh, central vagal stimulant, and it can also cause what's called stiff chest syndrome, where the chest literally just becomes rigid and you're unable to ventilate the patient without um, a neuromus neuromuscular blockade. Sufentanyl, very similar to fentanyl. Uh, it's uh, stronger so the doses are lower. It's a little faster on, a little faster off. Succinylcholine, very rapid on. You have to be aware of the complications of hyperkalemia though. Um, clearly, uh, Patients with intraabdominal sepsis, neuromuscular disorders, tetanus, burn injuries, denervating injuries, these patients can have a profound increase in, uh, in serum potassium uh, if you uh, uh, use even just a single intubating dose of succinylcholine. 
succinylcholine will increase the interocular, intracranial, and intergastric pressure. So it's contraindicated in open globe injuries, uh, relatively contraindicated. And patients have profound cerebral hypertension. There's some uh, evidence that it might increase the risk of aspiration from increased intragastric pressure, but I'm not sure that we can say that that's really clinically relevant. Um, it's still our safest option. Rocuronium, rapid onset vecuronium, is a very rapid non depolarizer. Uh, at a milligram per kilo, it uh, gives you good intubating conditions within about 30 seconds. Uh, but its standard of deviation for offset is huge, so it may be around, a single intubating dose may be around anywhere between 40 and 180 minutes. So you'll lose your neuro exam for up to three hours after uh, intubating a patient with rocuronium. Maintenance, we use inhaled agents. There's a dose-dependent decrease in blood pressure. Nitrous can be very dangerous. Nitrous diffuses quickly and easily under high pressure into gas spaces in the body. Pneumomediastinum, pneumothorax can become tension uh, problems very quickly. So we avoid nitrous in uh, trauma patients. Um, and again, you need to be ready to change things quickly because things can change very quickly. I've seen very stable patients where the surgeon lifts up the liver and exposes an open uh, uh, IVC and things can change very quickly. Awareness under anesthesia is uh, certainly a problem. 43% of patients that had the anesthesia discontinued for more than 20 minutes had awareness. Sometimes it's just having to say you're sorry because corpses have no awareness. And we do explain to patients and patients' families that this does occur, especially in trauma and emergency surgery. Renal failure is associated with a very high mortality, so it's something we try to avoid um, uh, at all costs in the operating room with trying to avoid hypotension and ATN and trying to avoid nephrotoxins. Hypotension interoperatively is most commonly secondary to hemorrhage and hypovolemia, but we can't forget anaphylaxis, you know, the other things, cardiogenic, obstructive, and distributed shock. So hypothermia, does it promote platelet migration by decreasing the hematocrit? Shorten the lifespan of platelets in vivo? Cause hemoconcentration and leukopenia? Lead to DIC by speeding up coagulation enzymes and disrupting platelet function? So the correct answer is C. Um, I think the answer to D is a little misleading and it can lead to DIC, but it's really by slowing down coagulation enzymes. Okay, hypothermia slows the, uh, the enzymatic reactions. Uh, it does cause hemoconcentration, uh, primarily by um, slowing down the lymphatic system and so that the plasma is actually sequestered in the lymphatic system. That's what leads to the increase in uh, hematocrit and uh, uh, leukopenia. The, it does, although it does shorten the lifespan of platelets in uh, vitro, it doesn't in vivo. So platelets uh, survive as long in the human body and uh, hypothermia, they just don't work as well. It does, uh, and it does not promote uh, platelet migration, again, because it uh, doesn't decrease hematocrit. Hypothermia causes an increase in hematocrit. So our goal is to keep the core temperature greater than 35 degrees. Um, hypothermia is common in the operating room, especially in these patients, for a number of reasons. People under general anesthesia are essentially poikilotherms. They don't have normal thermal regulation. They have decreased heat production. And um, because of the exposure of some of these cases, uh, we can have excessive heat loss. Um, and although it does decrease metabolism by 8%, for every degree Celsius it drops, which decreases the oxygen demand. It also leads to arrhythmias, 
uh, decreased uh, hepatic and renal flow, so that can interfere with our uh, drug metabolism. There's a coagulopathy, again, because of platelet dysfunction and DIC um, leads to acidosis. It, impair, it impairs immune function and, uh, again, it decreases the plasma volume, increasing blood viscosity. DIC is a problem. It's an activation of the coagulation cascade. Um, clearly, it's, it's diagnosed with um, clinical bleeding, low platelets, low fibrinogen, and uh, D-dimer. These are all very nonspecific uh, indicators. Treatment is just essentially treating underlying cause and replacing the factors. Uh, other problems we have, clearly there's lots of surgical teams, so we need lots of anesthesiologists. We have limited access to the patient, and um, a lot of times we can't get to them and monitors stop working. We try not to extubate these patients postoperatively unless they meet those criteria we went to in the la uh, through the last talk. We need to be absolutely clear that they're adequately resuscitated, they have good gas exchange, there's no obstruction, and um, no brain injury. ARDS is clearly a, a problem, risk factors of ARDS, multi-system trauma. Uh, any high injury, any, any uh, injury with a high injury severity score, hypotension. If they receive greater than 150 Cs during the first hour of hospitalization, that's a risk factor for ARDS, and an initial PO2 of less than 70 TOR. Treatment goals, of course, just optimize oxygenation, uh, prevent barrel and volume trauma, prevent oxygen toxicity, treat the underlying condition, and uh, oftentimes in the operating room, we'll need to bring in a more sophisticated ventilator because our machines just won't do it. MODS is the most common cause for late death in sepsis and trauma. Um, treatment goals are, again, just supportive essentially in nature. We try to maintain a pH of greater than 7.2. Nutritional support is actually very important. We want to initiate that as quickly as possible, control infection, and um, do everything we can to maximize delivery of oxygen. Other problems in the operating room, severe head trauma, anyone with a Glasgow coma scale of less than eight that leaves the brain susceptible to further injuries. Uh, we need to ensure interoperatively an adequate cerebral perfusion pressure. We shoot for greater than 70. We want to keep the delivery of oxygen adequate Keep them normal volemic. Um, initial hypoventil hyperventilation to decrease uh, intracranial hypertension. I can't say I don't use it. It just uh, can lead to worsened outcomes according to the literature. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>